so yeah, let's start with the Mentimeter quiz. I'll wait for you guys to join. You can see the details at the top there, but let me post them in the chat as well for convenience. Uh, so menti.com and one, two, six, six, five, nine, one. There we go. And you don't need the spaces here. So one, two, six, six, five, nine, one. Will work as well. Cool. I see one person already joined. That's good. Hmm. Can I not like hide this? Uh, show task, show people in the taskbar, taskbar settings, maybe. Sorry, guys, I just, it's a bit annoying having it there. Automatically hide the taskbar. Okay, that helps. There we go. That'll work. Cool. Okay, I'll wait for other people to join. Judson, your brothers are here, right? So. Cool. Then I'll wait for everyone to join, unless you guys are on a team, which, hmm, I think that might be a bit of an advantage. <laughs> Uh, okay, but we'll, I'll wait a little while longer. I'll give you guys like another minute. Do, 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 do. Okay, I'm going to get started. Remember that you can join midway through as well. Just have to play catch up. Answer fast to get more points. What are the basic building blocks of an entity relationship diagram? Hmm. Starting off pretty okay. So this is the first thing we covered in last week's lecture. Suppose the name does give away the answer a little bit, hey, on this one. Still, you do have to be quick. So, okay. Huh, interesting. So someone said class, property, and relationship. You know what, Fair, we did compare it to a class and a property, right? Because an entity and an attribute is kind of the same idea as a class and a property. And the same here, we did compare attributes to properties, although calling a relationship a link is a little bit suspicious, I think. Um, and yeah, the key here, guys, was look at the name of the diagrams. They're called entity relationship diagrams. So entity and relationship, they're definitely going to be there. And huh, actually, the only answer that had the word entity and relationship was entity, attribute, and relationship. Um, but yeah, cool. Onwards and upwards to question two. Which anomaly can result in the unexpected removal of data from the database? So what do we call an anomaly that results in the unexpected removal of data from the database? Hmm. So if you guys recall, ah, Soham, you made it. Sorry, we had already started. Um, you can, st ah, you did join, I think, because there's five people now. Okay, so some people said update anomaly, interesting. Um, hmm. So an update anomaly is when you have to update multiple records to change one field, if you guys recall. Um, yeah, that's correct, Soham. Um, so cool. Ooh, did I type it wrong or something? No, okay, cool. It's the same. Okay, so yeah, 
not bad, not bad, 60%. So yeah, the update anomaly, interesting. I thought more people would choose remove anomaly because I put that one in there intentionally to trick people. Um, but yeah, okay, most people got delete anomalies, so that's good. So remember, there were delete anomalies, insert anomalies, and update anomalies. Okay, question three of five, let's go. Which normal form requires that all non-key columns are functionally dependent on the entire primary key. So which normal form requires that all non-key columns, so you remember that each one of them has their own little rule. Um, so the rule is always that it must be in the previous normal form and then they have an extra thing on top of that. So which one has the rule that all non-key columns must be functionally dependent on the entire primary key? I do remember only one of them used the word entire, hey? Okay, cool, most people got it, that's cool. So some people said three and F. Um, and some people said 1NF. So remember, 1NF means that the table must not contain multiple values. No columns must contain multiple values. 2NF, um, well, it means that it must be in 1NF and that all non-key columns are functionally dependent on the entire primary key. And 3NF means that it must be in 2NF and that there must be no functional dependence between non-key columns, okay? Cool. Anyway, nice, nice. Question four of five. You need to modify some of the records in the library table. Which SQL statements can achieve this? So we need to modify some of the records in the library table. Wow, you guys were quick here. Jeez, four people answered basically instantaneously. I mean, it does make sense, the word that we use to do this, right? Like how would we update an existing record inside the table? Oh, damn it, whoops. <laughs> but those who answered fastest will still um, get the advantage. Ah, okay, actually more split than I thought. Okay, so insert is how we would insert a new record into the table, right? Like we wouldn't modify some of the records in the table using insert. We would insert new records into the table. Select, select doesn't modify anything about the data. Select just gives you the data, right? Like as the name implies, select will just give you, select some of the data from the, from the database and give it to you. Delete, okay, no one said delete. Um, so hopefully you, you guys can agree, we wouldn't modify using the delete statement. Or I guess you're modifying in a way, but you're removing it, okay. Um, and updates is how we modify. Um, so we would say sort of update set. Um, you guys can see it on the slide. Cool. On to the last question. This one I think is a bit tough, bit of a challenge. After coding and testing your update statements, you notice that every row in the table is updated. How can you address this? Oh, actually, this is not so bad. I, I overplayed this one. So how would we make it so that the update statement doesn't update every single row? And we could ask the same question about other statements, right? How do we stop them operating on every single row? Huh, interesting. Okay, so you guys, I think the reason you said set is because update does have the word set in it. But remember, um, this is saying that it's updating every single row. So it's like when you run, if you just run delete from table, then it deletes the everything in the table, right? It deletes everything in the table if you say delete from table. Likewise, if you say select star from table, it selects every single row in the table. And if you say update table, update the table's name, set column one equal to title, then every single um, field inside column one will be updated to title. In order to stop it from updating every row, we have to say where and then specify a condition. Okay, so maybe that one was a little bit tough or maybe some people were just rushing, I'm not sure. Okay, but anyway, nice, nice done guys. Um, been a while since we did a Mentimeter quiz. Uh, everyone got at least one white, right? That's very good. Um, and the max was three, not too bad. Well, it could have been four um, either way. Nicely done to agent X9, was that 10, 9, 19? I'm not sure, um, but, but well done agent 19, I guess is how you would say that. Cool. Anyway, so let's just pick up where we left off from there. I see 
uh, attendance is still not great, but there could be tests and stuff coming up. So fair enough. Um, so where we left off last week is here. We, we left off on relations. So I won't bore you with the slide. We can see the code actually. I uh, can't believe my luck. I'm late for one lesson and <laughs> yeah, unlucky Saham, because I know you do like the Mensi quizzes and you're never late as well. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so we have this table and I can select from the table, right? So I can say select star from table. So that's select all from table. Um, oh, not from table, sorry, from the name of the table, obviously, and the name of the table that I want to select from is book. Um, but you see that we have added a relation to this table. So I'm going to say select star from book, um, and that gives us everything in the book table. But we have this, we created this relation, but relationship between the book table and the genre. So each book specifies an ID of the genre that it corresponds to. So if a book is a three, that means it's fantasy. If a book is a two, that means it's fiction. If a book is a one, that means it's philosophy. So we've got a three, one, one, two, two are the genres of our books. And so we've got these two tables and we need to join the tables together, right? So like I want the genre ID, I want that to instead display the actual genre that corresponds with that. So how do we join the tables together? We wanna join the book and genre tables together. So we're gonna say, I'll, I'll just show you what genre. So this is what books looks like. It's got ID, title, author, and genre ID. And if I just select all from genre, then it'll just give us, uh, ooh, okay, cool, that's fine. So if I select all from genre, you can see that we've got three genres, philosophy, fiction, fantasy, and this just has ID and name. Okay, so where genre ID and book um, is the same as the genre's name, we wanna just, um, we wanna join the two tables together on the ID. Okay, um, we did explain this last week mostly, cool. So we've got select star from book and I wanna join it to genre. How we do that is we say inner join genre. So we are taking book and we are joining it to genre. So book in a join genre. And we need to tell it what column we're joining on. So the columns we are joining on is where book dot genre ID. Okay. So where the genre ID in the book table is equal to the genre, the ID column in the genre table. So genre dot ID. Book dot genre ID must equal genre dot ID. Okay, and that gave us this table here. We saw this all last week, so I'm just reminding you got where we were. So this is what we had over here. So that is now the statement to select everything from the genre table. And now we can work with this one large table that we have here. So we joined the two tables together. We joined the, so if you see the first like four columns up to genre ID, the first four columns are the book table and the last two columns are the genre table and we join them together on their ID. So you see where genre ID is three, we get fantasy, one philosophy, another one philosophy, two twos, which are both fiction, okay. Um, so now we can treat this all as like one big table. And so I can say where genre dot name equals fiction, for example, and that'll give me all the fiction books. So where it equals fiction, that'll give me all the fiction books. So if I run that, you can see that I now only get Giovanni's Room and Sylvia because they're both fiction, okay. But you can see that this is a really, really long SQL statement, right? Like these SQL statements are getting really long. So if I wanted to select all the fiction books and then someone comes to me like the following day and they say, by the way, we want a list of all the philosophy books on the database, then I would have to go to to wherever I'm editing the SQL statements and I would have to write out a whole nother expression, right? Like the following day. And it's basically everything is the same. You guys see, I have to write out this whole long statement. Um, and you can see that they're getting really long. And the, lo the only thing that I would change if I wanted to select philosophy books is this last entry here. I would change to philosophy, right? And then that will give me all the philosophy books. But you can see that was an awful lot of typing for such a simple request, right? Um, and so basically that's what the problem we've run into here. As soon as we added these relationships, as soon as our database starts getting complicated, we end up typing a lot, okay? We end up typing a lot. So how do we fix this? 
The answer is what SQL calls procedures, okay? Stored procedures. Now, a procedure is basically just what a method is. You guys remember from C Sharp, we have methods and functions, right? Remember in JavaScript, we also had functions. So we've got methods and functions in these other languages. Procedures is just what SQL calls a function, okay? It's basically the same thing, and you'll see that now. So how we make um, SQL procedures varies slightly according to the version of SQL that you're using. Like um, the, the version in your book from 100 years ago looks something like this, okay? It says create procedure, um, whatever the procedure's name is, as, and then you put your SQL query there and then you type return, okay? That's a very old way of doing it. It's on page 160 of your book. And yeah, so if you see that format in a test or whatever, you can, you'll understand it. It's nothing, nothing too hectic. The, the more modern way of doing this is, is like what we have on the right here. We say create procedure, the procedure's name, we have our two normal brackets there, and then we say the beginning of the procedure, we type our SQL query, and then the end of the procedure. Um, however, there is one little problem, but we'll, we'll check it out together inside the code. So what I'm gonna do is instead of having to type this all out, so um, as an example, I'm gonna assume that we would very frequently be selecting everything from our tables, right? Like this SQL statement here, select star from book in a join on genre on book.genre ID equals genre ID. This I think would be a very common request, right? And perhaps it would be even more common if we just said, um, ooh, okay, hold on. Um, Perhaps it would be even more common if what we were doing instead was printing out just like the title, so book.title, book.author, and let's say genre.name, genre.name. You can see how long this request is, right? How long the SQL query is, just to print out the title, the author, and the genre name of all of our books, okay? So that gives us the title and the author. This is just getting a list of all the books we have in our database, basically. You can see that this is a very long request. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save this request into the database itself, okay? Um, and that's all a procedure is. So instead of just storing data, you can also store particular queries. So let's just start by doing that. How do we store a, a query? We call it a procedure, a stored procedure. And how we do it is we say create procedure, create procedure. We give the procedure a name. So I'm gonna say, we'll call this one get books. Okay, get books. Okay, that's our procedure. We say begin and end. And then in between the begin and the end over here, we just type out what our procedure is. Okay, so or what our query is. So our query in this case is this thing over here. Okay, cool. So when we look at this, all right, this, this looks pretty fine. That looks fairly standard. You'll notice this is not exactly what I have in the slide. So let me just explain why that is. And in fact, I would be interested in hearing if any of you guys can see a problem that we would run into here. Okay, so I'll talk through what this is doing. So create a procedure. This is saving a thing called get books onto the database, okay, called get books. And it says, okay, I'm gonna begin the command. Okay, begin the command. And that's cool, so begin the command. And then this is the query that we actually store into the database. <clears throat> and notice we store it with the semicolon. So what does that mean to SQL when it sees this query? And then it sees end on the next line. So what do you guys think a problem? Does anyone know a problem from what I've told you so far? What kind of problem could we have in running this? If we just think about it, how a computer thinks about this. So it sees begin, okay, then it sees a query. It reads the whole query, it reads a semicolon. What happens, guys? What, what do we think a problem with this is? Does anyone know? It's a very subtle problem. So I, I was interested to see if anyone could figure it out. Would it confuse? Exactly, Ria. Nice, nice, yeah, thinking out the box, that's good. Yeah, so you can see that number one, so if we look at all of our previous queries, every single one of them has had a semicolon at the end, right? Or every single one of our SQL statements, um, they always have these semicolons at the end. 
you can see that this one doesn't, right? So we would ideally want to put a semicolon at the end over there. But what's going to happen here is that it's going to read this first semicolon and it won't read the end, right? It's going to read that first semicolon and it'll be like, okay, that's the end of this uh, query um, or the end of this statement. So I can stop reading over there and then it'll read end on the next line and it'll just be like, end what? What do you mean end? There's nothing to end because begin closed at the semicolon. Okay. And then this semicolon also becomes kind of pointless because the query ended over there. So what we have to do, and it's, it's a weird thing, it's a bit annoying that you have to do this in SQL, but you know, it's a powerful language, so we kind of just put up with it, is we, so what they call this is a delimiter, okay, a delimiter, um, because it's, it's, it's limiting the end, so it's limiting your line, it's like specifying the end of your line, and it's also separating the lines from each other, okay, so it's called the delimiter. Um, D, um, the same as like in defense, the D stands for like um, separate with a fence, right, defense. Um, so delimiter here means the same thing. The D is like for separate and limiter is because it's limiting the, the length of your line or limiting where your lines are, okay. So what we do is we say delimiter and we say slash slash, okay. And all that means is that everything that SQL reads after this, everything that SQL reads after this, it is going to, instead of treating semicolons like semicolons, it's going to treat slash slash like semicolons. So when it sees this query, it doesn't stop reading at the semicolon because it's expecting you to say slash slash when you want to end a line. And then after the end, we say slash slash. So that's all we're doing there. And now that confusion will no longer happen. Okay, cool. So we've got our stored procedure. That's what it looks like. And then instead of typing out this whole long procedure over here to select all the books from the database, um, instead of typing out that whole long procedure, we can just say call, call, and then we can just type the name of our procedure, get books, call, get books, and we run that. Um, and what this does is you see it runs our query. That runs our query, okay? So call get books now goes ahead and it runs the query that's inside the procedure. So we've stored that procedure on our database. Okay, so now instead of typing out that whole procedure, we can just write get books. Quite clever. Um, so that's just a method, basically. Procedures are basically just methods. You can see this is a lot like um, if we said static, void, whatever, um, or in this case, it wouldn't be returning void. It would be returning this table over here. Um, the name of the method, right? It's very similar to those C sharp and JavaScript methods and functions. Okay. So that's what a procedure is. Not too bad. And yeah, you can run it using call. We'll see a little bit later that you can also execute these procedures inside C sharp, um, but we'll, or we can execute queries generally inside C sharp. Um, but yeah. The, the next thing I want to show you is that just like methods, you can pass in parameters. We call these parameterized procedures. Um, so it's the same as like if you create a method in C sharp that takes in two integers, those two integers are the parameters being taken into the method. And like you add them together or you multiply them by each other or something like that. Like that function we created in JavaScript when we were making our website, the calculator. So just like with those functions and methods, we can also take parameters into a procedure. And it's pretty easy to do. So let's say I wanted to say where genre.name equals. And I want you be, to be able to pass whatever genre you like into get books. So you can fetch a specific genre's um, books, all the books that we have of a particular genre. And I want you to be able to just pass in a genre. So in get books, I want you be, to be able to say fiction, and then it'll get all the fiction books. I want you to be able to say philosophy, and then it'll get all the philosophy books, etc. Okay. So how do we do that? We just say, in the brackets after get books, we can say in, and then like the genre you want to take into the procedure. So we want to say genre, we're going to call it genre. That's the name of the variable, the name of the parameter we're taking in. And then the type of the parameter that we're taking in. And it's a var char 255. You remember that's how SQL says a string with 255 characters maximum. Okay. And then instead of saying genre name equals whatever particular genre, we can say genre name equals genre. Okay. That is the name of the parameter that we took in. And now if I say call get books fiction, and I run this, 
you can see it gets all the fiction books. If I say get fantasy, then it will get all of the fantasy books. And you can see that now we don't have to type out that whole long procedure every time. It's just stored really conveniently on the database. Okay. Cool. So that's that, guys. That's stored procedures. And that's actually it for SQL. That's all we need to know about SQL. Um, I posted that module two of the understanding databases um, thing, like the understanding databases module. Um, that little exercise, those online exercises. And that whole thing will just be on the things you learned in this slide, in these slides. So maybe if I didn't explain something to your liking, maybe you could pick it up there. Or if, you're, if you just need to cement your knowledge or whatever, it's a good study source. So I posted that on a group. Please finish that before um, next week's lecture. So the um, module two of understanding databases. And yeah, cool. We are done with SQL. And now this here on database connections, on how do we connect to a database? How do we use databases in apps? How do we format the data from databases? This will actually be the last lecture that we do in the course, okay? Mm. Have some water. So yeah, this will be our last lecture. I don't know if we'll finish it today. Uh, we because there's no rush really. We ended up having quite a bit of time extra. Um, so yeah, but we do want to finish before your exam. So next week will probably be our last one. Uh, we'll, I, we'll probably finish off this lecture and then get finish off these slides and then get into, um, get into some revision. Okay, cool. But anyway, so database connections, lesson 19. All right. So this starts, um, the, the order that your book goes in is a little bit different to the order that I think we should go in. Um, we're going to start on page 167 of this final section, um, page 116 of your textbook on XML. Okay, the reason I decided to do XML, do you guys remember where we covered this before? Do any of you remember? Because we have learned about XML before a little bit. Where have we seen XML before, guys? Do any of you remember where in the course we saw XML? What particular section? Anyone remember? Web developments, exactly. And even more specifically than that, does anyone remember? It was in chapter four, that's correct. It was in chapter four. But even more specifically, what particular aspects of web development, what was it? What thing was it that made use of XML a lot? HTML, similar, they both markup languages, that's true. Um, but yeah, it was web services, guys, web services. This is how we passed data between web services, right? Like you would pass whatever values you're giving to the web service and it would pass its response in XML as well, right? Um, so why did we do it that way? Well, XML, what it's designed for is to pass data around, okay? It is a text-based way, a text-based way to represent structured data. So that's all XML is, that's its purpose. And XML is super easy to read as you guys have already seen before. So I've given you some XML on the left there. Can, can any of you read it? Um, what, is, what is this XML saying? Can someone give me a brief description in the chat? What is that XML saying, guys? Without any practice, we, we don't really have to discuss it. It's very obvious to, to read, I think. Um, XML is really nicely structured. Anyone know? What is that XML over there trying to represent? Anyone have any ideas? Tesla sales, someone says. That's interesting. OK. Is, is that all it's representing, only Tesla? Yeah, exactly. The name and the price of various companies on the stock market. So in this case, we only have two companies, but you can imagine having more. Okay, so there's Tesla and Neo. They're both like electric car manufacturers. Um, and you can see that their stock prices are reflected there as well. Okay, so we've got company name and stock price. Um, and you can see that this, it's fairly easy to read, like to anyone, even if you don't have training in um, XML, uh, you can just read it line by line and you'll kind of understand what's going on, okay? And this thing on the right, what is this trying to represent? Anyone? 
Anyone have any ideas? Slightly more difficult, but you can see from like the name of the tags, a post with a caption, exactly. So we've got a username, a caption, and a URL to, to particular images, right? JPG images, precisely. Okay, so you guys can see this is a very sensible way of representing um, data, right? Like it's very easy for us to read, computers can read it too, um, it makes a lot of sense. So this is XML, and the reason we call it XML, so extensible markup language. So it's a markup language. That's a language that's designed to be readable to both humans and computers. And the reason we call it extensible, so extensible markup language, extensible because you can extend it kind of. So you can add your own tags. So you can see companies. Companies is not a tag that exists in XML. Images is not a tag that exists in um, XML company name, stock price, none of these tags exist in XML. You can just make up your own tags. Okay, that's what's so cool about XML. You can just make up tags. Um, so that's why it's called extensible because you can extend the list of tags that it has. Okay, um, so that's pretty cool. There's just a few things that you guys need to know about XML and then we'll just work with it a little bit so to, to show you guys a little example um, of how we might process and, and use XML. So. Um, the first thing is the only thing that's weird about the XML document really is the first line, okay? And that's what we call the XML declaration. So that's specifying the version of XML you're using and the encoding that your computer is using to, um, to store it. Okay, so these are called processing instructions. They're not super important anymore. We don't, you don't really need to understand them in detail. Um, but yeah, you must know what this line is referring to. So if I ask you to specify, if I ask you a question like, what are the processing instructions in this XML file? You know, to just look at the first line. The first line in the XML documents will be, um, will be the, the processing instructions, okay. Um, the, the next important thing, just terminology, like how we refer to XML is, um, is the idea of an XML element, okay? So XML elements. Okay, so um, an XML element is, is any, any um, couple, so any couple of an opening and closing tag. So any pair of an opening and closing tag. So you can see in, in this green box here, we have company ID equals Neo. This is the opening of an XML element and that XML element closes at that slash company, okay? So all of that would be described as a single XML element, including the company name and stock price inside that XML element. That's all a part of the same XML element. Company name, Neo Inc slash company name, that's another XML element. Stock price slash stock price, that's another XML element. Likewise, on the right here, we have desk for description. Um, so description to slash desk, that's one XML element. Any pair of opening and closing is what's called an XML element, just in like common parlance, okay? Um, and now we can get into just practically using, using some XML um, in C Sharp. And what we'll use to, to work with and process XML is a namespace called system.xml system.xml is the namespace we'll use to, to handle some XML documents inside C Sharp. Okay, so I've got an XML document right over here. Can someone tell me, uh, as just one more bit of practice, what is this XML document trying to represent, guys? And you can see they all have like a fairly similar structure. And I'll ask you another question about this one, actually, because emails, basically, exactly. Not even basically, exactly, yeah. This is what this is trying to represent. We've got a person, it's to, a person from, subject and body. I suppose there's no email address, so you're correct to say basically, Sam. Um, but yeah, can I ask you guys one more question? So you can see all of the XML we have here, it's not compulsory for it to have this. But if you see here, it says company ID equals TSLA. Here it says image ID equals one. And over here it says email ID equals one. So huh, what, what is ID equals one? Why might that be useful? It's not compulsory for our XML to have that, but what do you think that could be used for guys? If I was working with this data, 
where might that be useful? While you think about that, I'm going to uh, create a new project quickly. Where might that be useful, guys, that all of our things have an ID? What would we call that? What is that expected, expected to be used for? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start up, I'm going to open up a C Sharp console app inside uh, Visual Studio. Okay. Um, console app one, that's cool. I'll get, call it uh, Brianston 06. Okay. Where else have we seen IDs? Let me ask you that. Where else have we seen IDs? Yeah, our project's being created. Anyone know? Hmm. Let me ask you this. What would we call this ID attribute? What do you expect we would call this ID attribute if it was inside a database? What would we call it? A property? Yeah, yeah. But more specifically, this, this ID one is... Yes, that's what I was looking for. You're, you're correct to call it a, a property or an attribute more accurately. We might say attribute. Um, but yeah, primary key is what I was looking for because it it's if we were translating this XML, let's say we were reading this XML into a database or reading this XML from a database, you can imagine that ID would be very useful, right? Because we don't have to think about what the primary key is. It's given to us. Okay. Um, so yeah, that, that is what I was going for, but, um, but yeah, I, technically it is also an attribute. Um, so both work. Cool. But all of them are attributes, right? Also to would be an attribute in a database, from would be an attribute, subject would be an attribute, body would be an attribute, email would be an entity, right? Email or emails would be an entity, either one you could choose really. Um, cool. Um, so that's our XML document that we're going to be working with. So that is saved on my computer. Let me just go ahead and open it. Um, so here's emails.xml on my computer. I'm just going to uh, copy that and I'm going to put it over here. Okay, because I know that this is where um, after we compile our code, this is where the executable will be, will be solved. So are we ending at five today? No, I don't think so. Um, Oh, you're asking for a break. We'll we'll take a break just now, I think. Uh, let me just um, start by doing this quick because uh, it is still a little early. 15.43. Can't take my two minutes, Azam. Okay, so it's using system.xml. So the system, remember this, guys, the system.xml namespace, it should be pretty easy to remember, right? It's pretty well named. The system.xml namespace has a bunch of classes and interfaces used when working with XML documents, okay, system.xml. So um, that's a good start, I think, uh, to, to figure that out. And yeah, so we'll just, essentially, there's two things that we can do, okay, uh, in a way. We can read from the XML documents or we can write to the XML documents, okay? So in XML reader, there's these two classes. There's XML reader and there's XML writer. And those are the two classes that we're going to be, to be using when reading and writing XML, like as the name suggests, I think. Um, and these are just fairly standard. You, you'll recognize the way that we work with them. It's not going to be too difficult, I don't think. There's just a couple of methods that I'm going to have to demonstrate to you guys. Um, so I think, yeah, I, we can do a break now, I suppose. Hmm, how long should we go? I'm going to give a short break today because I do want to... Hmm, yeah, we'll break until like 15.50. Okay. So yeah, short break. Quick sprints, get some water. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat and I'll address them when we start again. Um, and flip over to page, what is it? Uh, let me check. Uh, 168 of your textbook is where we'll continue when we come back. Okay, 168. Um, mostly 169, though. It's like between the two pages. Um, cool. I'll be back now.
I think it's weird that they chose to end the course on, on this section. But I guess it's not, not the worst. Uh, so has it been decided if we are writing this year or next? And also is each topic we have done going to be tested plus how hard is it on a scale of one to 10? That's a lot of questions. Um, so I don't, I, I haven't been notified if it has been decided. Um, I assume it'll be however all of the students vote. Um, personally, I would want to get it over with this year, um, I think because then you don't have to study, you know, go into the new year and immediately start studying for something and you'd have forgotten everything by then maybe. Although maybe letting it brew for a little while isn't the worst thing either. Um, is each topic we have done going to be tested? Yes, it's the, the whole thing is tested. Um, I forgot the weightings actually, let me just check. I do have them written somewhere here. Uh, the weightings for each section, uh, where is it? Mm. Huh. Can't find it now. All right, okay. That's strange. 20% chapter one, it seems, 20% chapter two, 20% chapter three, and then the remaining 40% is split between the rest, I think. I know that um, se section five is not tested too much and section six uh, also. But yeah, each topic, and we'll give you the detailed weightings and some past papers to study with. I don't know. I don't have the full split. Yeah. Um, and how hard is it on a scale of one to 10? It's not too bad. Um, probably easier than the mock tests you guys have been writing, I think. Easier than those. But obviously, there's more content. But that's why we have to do revision um, of the stuff we covered earlier in the course. No problem. Good question though. We do have pretty high pass rates um, usually. It's Cause yeah, we do lots of revision and stuff and discussions. Okay, guys, let's get started again. Um, yeah, so this is pretty easy, actually. What we're going to do is create an XML reader to just read that little XML file that we created. Okay, so right over here, we have this emails.xml, and we're going to create a little console application um, that we can just run that will go ahead and execute, uh, go and read that XML and just print it out in the console. Okay, and while we're doing it, we'll stop and sort of discuss some of what's going on. Okay, so the first thing is we need to create an XML reader. All right, so there's two, there's two things, XML readers and XML writers. An XML writer would write to an XML document. We might see that demonstrated a little bit later. An XML reader will read from an XML document. So what we're looking for currently is an XML reader because we're reading from an XML document. Um, and so what we're going to do is say, exactly how we create objects all the time, you guys know, um, right? So uh, we, if we were creating a rectangle, like an object of type rectangle, we would give it a type, right? So it needs a type and our object needs a name. I'm gonna call mine reader, okay? That's the standard name for it. You can see uh, Visual Studio even nicely recommends some names for you. You can call it reader or XML or lowercase x XML reader, anything like that. I think reader is a good name. So I'm gonna call it that. However, 
what you'll see is usually how we would do this is we'd say XML reader equals new XML reader, right? We would say something like that. Um, but let's sort of read through um, what, what happens when we try to do this, okay? So there we go, I said it, I said new XML reader. That's how we would usually create an object, but you can see that this says represents a reader, blah, 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 and then it says CS, can someone read that error to me? Cannot create an instance of the abstract class or interface XML reader. I just ended up reading it because I know you guys don't like turning on your mics. Um, okay. So cannot create an instance of the abstract class or interface XML reader. Do you guys remember what abstract was? Can you guys tell me here, where would I type abstract? On what lines before would I be able to type abstract? You can post in the chat, like line eight, line nine. Where would I, if I wanted to make um, an abstract class here, where would I type it? Line 10, exactly. We would say something like abstract class. Right, something like that. If we wanted to make our web class program abstract. And that's exactly what they've done with XML reader. Okay, XML reader is an abstract class. Okay, if you guys remember what that is. So that, so that means you, um, hmm, um, you can't instantiate it directly. You can't just say XML reader equals new XML reader. That's, that's not allowed, okay. Uh, means that you only want to be able to inherit from it, basically. You don't want to be able to instantiate it directly, okay? Um, however, XML reader does have a method that we can use, dot .create, dot .create, and you can give it the name of emails.xml. Cool, but I now have another question for you, another, another important question. So you guys can see that I'm able to use dot .create, right? I'm able to use this create method, without creating an object of type XML reader. You guys can see I haven't created an object of type XML reader. Nowhere did I say new XML reader because it wouldn't even let me, right? But I'm still able to use this dot create. So what does that mean? What is create? What word, when they created this method, this create method, what word did they use in its declaration that allows me to use it without an object? Does anyone know, right? So what, what this means is that this create method belongs to XML reader itself. It belongs to the class. It doesn't belong in, to any object of, of that class. So what's special about create guys? What word did they use to create it that allows me to use it without an object? This is way back from chapter two, um, but it's pretty good revision, I think. What word did they use if I want you to be able to use a particular method without creating an object of the class that it is in, what word do we use? In fact, you can see an example of this, okay, void. Okay, so Ham says void. I, I mean, I'm liking it. We, we need a guess. Hey, okay. There were two choices basically, I think after Saham said void. Okay, so we it is static. Okay, it is static. I'm gonna remind you guys because it did take a little while. So So void, means that it doesn't return anything, right? Like return, you can't return like an integer, you can't return a string, you, you have to return nothing. So either you say return like that with nothing after it, or you just don't use the word return at all. That's what void means. The method doesn't return anything. Static means that you do not have to create an object of the class in order to use it. So in this example, like with our static void main, the computer can run main without creating an object of the program class, right? Like you could go program prog equals new program. We can do that, okay? We're allowed to do that. And we could then call like prog.main hypothetically. In this case, we can't because main is static, but you could picture if there's a non-static method, we could use that. Um, in fact, you have to do that if the method is not static, okay? But because it is static, because main is static, the computer can just run main. And that's the same thing that's happening with create here. We can just run create. We don't have to create an object of type program, um, or we don't have to create an object of type XML reader. We can just run create because it's static, okay? Um, so the same way here, we could go program.main, okay? We can just call it directly. We can just say program.main, and we have to give it a string of arguments, right? Um, but yeah, 
ooh, so we, we said equals that, but yeah, program.main, okay. Um, it, it expects a string args, but yeah, you could do this. And that's what the computer is doing basically when it runs your, runs your C-sharp document, okay, or it runs your C-sharp code. All right, anyway, so cool. So we have created an XML reader that's gonna read from a file called emails.xml. That's all we've done here. Um, and I explained all that abstract and static stuff just so you understand why we didn't say XML reader equals new XML reader. We just said XML reader equals XML reader dot create. We just created an XML reader directly. Okay, and that's actually the hardest step in all of us. This, that's the hardest part of reading an XML documents actually. Um, so now we can just say while Okay, while, okay, we're gonna loop over it. We're gonna loop over our XML reader. Damn, I should have asked you when, how, how we should have done that. Um, and we say reader.read, okay, reader.read. Um, and all that's gonna do is it's gonna read each element of our, uh, not even each element, it's more specific than that. We'll print out what it does now. Um, that's just gonna read each part of our XML documents. So in order to just show you this, I'm just gonna say console.write line uh, reader dots, uh, what should we print out? Uh, value, yeah, let's print out reader.value. We'll start with that. So we're just gonna say while reader.read console.write line reader.value, okay, that's that. Um, so let's just get an idea of what this reader is doing. So all this while reader.read is doing is it's going to run while this is not null. So you can think of this as being like while reader.read does not equal null um, is sort of the same thing. Okay, but everyone just does it like this. But you can see that's why it underlined it in green. It's like this is irrelevant. Okay, let's see. Let's see what Visual Studio's feedback is over here. Ah, okay, fair enough. That's why it wants to do it. Yeah, okay, fair, but whatever. So yeah, reader.read is the standard way of doing it. It's just gonna run while reader has something to read. It's gonna read line by line by line by line. Um, the next thing I wanna show you is just what XML reader does. So it says represents a reader. So you can see the little blurb, represents a reader that provides fast, non-cached. Okay, fast just means quick. It's a quick way to read XML documents. Non-cached means that it's not stored in your cache memory. We discussed cache memory a little bit in chapter four. And the important bit actually that you must remember is forward only, forward only. You can only read from left to right. You can't go backwards. You can only read down the documents, okay? Forward only. You can only read through the document. You process each line once. So all reader.read is doing is it's gonna read the first line or the first bit, the next 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 bit. It's just gonna read the, um, each bit as we say reader.read, okay? Um, and you'll see that now. And then I'm gonna print out reader.value just to get an idea of what's going on. Okay, so very simple app so far. I'm just gonna build it. Um, so it's compiling, da, 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 da. Build started. Yo, it is taking time. There we go. Console app one has been saved to here. I'm just gonna copy that whole directory name quickly, control C like so. Um, so that's where it saved it. And there we go, build one succeeded. We can jump back to my desktop. You can see it built here. Here's our emails.xml. So that's the document it's gonna be reading. And we saw that earlier, that XML documents. And there's our app, console app onexe So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna open this in command prompt as we did previously when running um, apps. Okay, so I'm opening it in command prompt. I'm going to chder, change directory to that directory I copied. So I'm in users, user, desktop, workspace, Bryanston 06, console app one, bin debug, right? You can see that's where I am over here. Okay, so I'm inside this folder. Um, in, in command prompt. And then I'm just gonna run console app one. Okay, console app one. Okay, like so. Um, and you can see this is what it prints out. So it prints out a whole bunch of new lines. Interesting, okay. Ali, a whole bunch of new lines. Josh, a whole bunch of new lines. Plans, a whole bunch of new lines. Wanna get some breakfast tomorrow. And then it prints out the next email as well, right? If you guys remember, this is what our email document looked like. Uh, let me just open it in text editor again. There we go. This is what our email document looks like. So you see it just prints it out each of the values in it. Okay, not too bad. Why did it print out all these new lines? This is weird. What's going on here? Um, so let's let's uh, try some other stuff. Let's um, customize this a little bit. 
So what I'm going to do next is instead of printing out reader.value, I'm going to print out reader.name. Okay, reader.name. So what this gives us, we can actually read the little blurb if, if it brings one up for us. Uh, okay, let's go. Um, returns the qualified name of the current node. Okay, um, so blah, blah, blah. You see, eventually they'll use the word elements. Yeah, elements, the tag name. Okay, so this is going to return the tag names of all of our uh, of all of our XML elements. And you guys remember what an XML element is? This is going to return the name of each element. So let's go ahead and check that out of the name of each node inside an element even. So, so all that's saying is it won't just return like email. It'll return email, but also the name here. So it's going to return that's one node. That's one node, that's one node, that's one node, right? That's two, this is one node, this is one node, this is one node, okay? So it's returning the names of those. Um, so let me build that. Build, okay, that's the time it compiled quite quickly and we're gonna run it again, okay? Look what it printed. Emails, email, two, two, from, from, subject, subject, body, body, email, email, two, two, from, from, subject, subject, body, body, email, emails. Okay, interesting. Is anything weird here to you guys? Do you have any questions about what I just outputted? Or, or any interesting comments about what just outputted? What does that look like to you? Is that fine? Does it make sense? Everyone, anyone have anything to say about what this just outputted here? Ooh. Mm. Hmm. Very interesting. Yes, good. Okay. Um, what is weird though? So we can we can look. Let's look at this. So it printed out email. Okay, that makes sense. So let's go through the each each tag. So we've got XML, XML, emails. It makes a huge tower. Yeah, almost. And the the really interesting thing. So you see, it said XML, XML. So that was the name of the first tag. Emails, emails, and then email. Okay, email, and then it says two. Okay, two was the next tag. You see it printed out two twice. I'm going to ask explicitly. I don't know if it makes sense to you guys. Does, does anyone know? Why did it print out two twice here? Why did it print out two twice? The end tag. Exactly. Okay, cool. I'm glad you guys did get it. So you can see it said emails, and there's no ending emails tag yet. Email, again, there's no ending email tag yet. Then it says two and two again, okay, because it was the opening and closing tag from from again, okay, subject, subject again, okay, body, body again, and then it prints it out email, and then email again, okay, because there was the closing tag, the opening tag of another email, and then it prints out two twice, from twice, subject twice, body twice, another email, and then emails, okay, it's the last thing it prints out, because the last closing tag is called emails, okay, yeah, that makes sense, hopefully, hopefully you guys get that, um, so now we're going to do some more interesting processing here, okay, um, just to sort of um, think about what's going on. So obviously we want to do a different thing with each email tag, right? That makes sense. So uh, let's try this out. So I'm going to say, hmm. what I'm going to print out next is I'm going to print out console.write just to give you an idea of what this is doing as well. So we're going to print out reader.name and we are going to print out... Um, with a space after it, we're going to print out reader dot is start element. Okay, is start element is what we're going to print out. Reader dot is start element. Okay. Um, so if you guys read that little blurb, what type does this return? What type does reader dot is start element return? Anyone tell me? Does it? Read the little blurb. What type does it return? That little blurb that Visual Studio gives us there. You can see the declaration of the method on the first line, actually. It returns a Boolean, exactly. So that's like true or false, right? True or false. So let's see what this prints out, um, if it runs. I'm not sure if we're going to have to convert it to a string or something, actually, but we'll see. 
Ah, okay, so it did work. So it prints it out, XML true, 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 false, to, false, true, false, from, false, true, false. Ha, huh. interesting, quite a crazy set of print statements that it's given us there. Okay, so XML true, 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 false, to, false, true, false, from, false, true. Hmm, what's going on here, guys? Um, ooh, what I want to check, it's weird that it didn't print out. Okay, what I'm going to do instead is console.writereader.name, something like that. Just to make it a little bit easier uh, for us to read. Something like that, so that might be easier to read. XML tree, not particularly, it looks very similar. Um, how can I explain this to you guys? So this is the email tag. I'm not sure why it didn't give us the name this time of all of them. Because when we were just printing out, you see it prints out emails. Oh, okay. Hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because the reader dot read runs again. Let's let's just read. Okay. So what reader dot is start elements is telling us is if it is the first element. So if it's a starting tag. So you can see XML is a starting tag. So it's true. The next tag was emails. Okay. So it's true. The next tag is email. So it's true because it's also a starting tag, right? Um, and, and it'll go through the list. And for each starting tag, it will output true. And for each ending tag, it will output false. Okay, so if the reader is a start element, it'll output true. And if it's not, it'll output false. So what we use this for is, we is we're just checking because you can see by the name, you can't tell by the name if a tag is the start or end tag, right? You can't tell by name if it's the start or end tag, but you can tell um, by is start elements. Okay, so yeah, we'll use a combination of these two things to process the documents. Okay, so we'll say while reader.read, and we're going to check, is the element we are working with currently a start element? Is it a start element? Okay, so if reader.is start elements, is it the start element for, for one of our nodes? Okay, now we'll check the name. So guys, you can see there's lots of possible names. If I were to, if I wanna set up conditions for each of these names, how would I do it? Which statement would I use? I want a certain thing to happen when it's, when the name is to. I want a certain thing to happen when the name is from. I want a certain thing to happen when the name is subject. I want a certain thing to happen when the name is body, right? I need to process each of these cases differently. So which, which statement would I use to, to process that? that information. I mean, I could say if to, if reader.name equals to, if reader.name equals equals from, if reader.name equals equals subject. Exactly. We're going to use a switch statements instead because it's a bit easier. Okay. So we're going to say switch over the name. Okay. So switch over reader.name. Okay. Like so. Okay. Pretty okay. Um, and we've got multiple names. Let's say we're only going to process two cases. We're going to process the case when it is a subject. Let's say we just want to print out the subject and body of each of our emails. So the case when it's the subject, we're going to do a certain thing. Okay. And the other case we're going to process is the case when it is a body. Okay, case body. Okay, cool. And yeah, so what we're gonna do in these two cases, we're just gonna say, all right, we're gonna read the value. So we just need to read one more, right? Because let me just explain what's going on there. That's why there's a space in between here. So let me just explain it like this. So we've got two that, so we, we go reader.read, is it a two? Is it two? Okay, is that the name of the node? If it is, we need to read one more time. That's what the new line is here. This new line is it's reading the inner text of the XML, right? So you can see after the two tag, 
So two, we had Ali. Okay, so we needed to read two, then read one more time to get Ali, and then we can get the text, right? Same with subject. We've got subject, so it read subject. So we check, is it a start element? Is it subject? If it is subject, we're gonna read one more time to get the text, okay? So that's all I'm saying here. So I'm saying, if it is a subject, we're gonna read one more time just to get the text out. And then we're just gonna print out console.write line. And I'm just gonna use that fancy formatting style with the, with the dollar sign, okay? So I'm just gonna say, um, what should I call it? Uh, actually, we can just do it this way, yeah. So I'm gonna call it, Mm, subject, obviously. So we'll say subject space like that. And we're just going to give it the reader dot value. Okay. The value that is held by the reader currently, which will be the text inside the subject tag. And the same I'll do here. So I'm going to read one more time to get the actual text that's held in the body. And then I'm going to say console dot write line. Um, and I'm going to print out the body of the email. In fact, we don't have to print out the body of the email, right? We can just print out reader dot value. We, we know that this is the body because it's below the subject. Okay, there we go. Like so. So let's see what this does. Build solution. And we'll come over to command prompt and we'll run it. And you see it says subject plans. Want to get some coffee? Want to get some breakfast tomorrow? Subject job offer. You got the job. When are you coming back to South Africa? So now it prints out the subject and the body of each of our emails. Okay. So we've gone ahead and processed that XML document using an XML reader. Okay. We spent a lot of time on this example, but hopefully you got some good understanding of how the reader is working, what it's doing at each step. Um, and yeah, so that's XML reader. Let's uh, head, head onwards. Um, hmm. Let me actually double check on the left here. Ah, it is here. Cool. I don't have to reopen it. That's good stuff. Okay. Cool. So that was an XML document. And you can imagine using that XML reader perhaps to, to do various things, right? We can output to the console. We could also pass it to another application that maybe automatically sends an email for each of the um, XML tags that we had. We could save it to a database, right? Using the ID as the primary key. We could do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so an XML reader is like one way to store data. Um, for either for a database or from a database. Okay, that's why it's in this section. The next thing we need to see is how do we actually connect to a database in C sharp, right? So um, how do we actually connect to a database in C sharp, right? We have all these SQL statements. We know how to create a database, to create tables in a database, how to insert data to a database, how to query it, but how do we actually do that stuff inside C sharp? Um, and it's actually quite an easy thing to do. Um, so System dot dot. So, hmm, actually, let me hide that. Let me hide that. I, I don't know if anyone read it, but if you did, then you should be able to get this answer. If you guys remember um, back to chapter four, even, we had this distinction. There were like two sides of a connection, if I can put it that way. What were the two sides of a connection, or what were the two sides of a request? Um, does, does, does anyone remember? They, like, there were two main players. Um, in handling requests and in um, connections and responses and all of that kind of stuff. What were the two main, um, hmm, how can I refer to them without, hmm, what were the two main players? Like um, the two sides, if you like, the two sides of this connection or response or request. Like there's you, and you put in a request somewhere. What do we call the two sides of this sort of relationship? That's a good way of paying it. Um, what do we call the two sides of the relationship? Does anyone remember? Hmm. Once I tell you the names, you'll, you'll understand what I'm trying to get at, but it's difficult to word this question properly. Yeah, no clue. Hmm. Do you guys remember there's a diagram that I showed you? Okay, so when you connect to a website, what do we call you? Let's put it that way. What do you call you when you're connecting to a website? The clients, exactly. What do we call the other side of that relationship? And the other side of that relationship, what do we call it? The server, exactly. So there's a client-server relationship. And this exists with databases as well. So there's a server that holds your database somewhere, right? There's a server. 
as a cycle, life cycle. <laughs> no, no, no. So it is client server is what I was trying to get at. Um, but you're right. There was a life cycle in chapter four as well. That was the page life cycle. That's how AspNet ha handles a request. Um, but yeah, cool. So client server. So there's there's the you're the client. You connect to the server and you put in a request. Okay. Um, so this exists with databases as well. There's a server that holds the database and there's you, a client, connecting to a database and making requests from it, right? And we use SQL to make those requests. Um, so inside C Sharp, we have a thing called a namespace, not a thing. We have a namespace called system.data.sql clients, system.data.sql clients. That is a namespace. And you can see it's called SQL clients. Because what this will allow you to do is turn your app, turn your application into an SQL client, a client for an SQL server or a database, right? That's what an SQL server would be. It's a server that runs SQL and holds a database, okay? So you're an SQL client. That's what this namespace will allow you to do. It gives you a bunch of stuff. It gives you a way to open an SQL connection, a way to specify SQL commands, and a thing to read the response of SQL commands called an SQL data reader, okay? So that's that. This is the code for it. Um, and yeah, I think the best way to see this is probably to just write up this code um, and to, to jump into this. Um, one thing I will ask you though, guys, this is some pretty risky code here that we have here because um, we're going to be opening up a connection to a database. There's a lot that can go wrong when we're connecting to a database on another server, right? Like the server could be closed. Um, the response, the, the request could fail. We could have a syntax error, like so much could possibly go wrong. So how am I going to do this? What statements am I going to put all this code in? This code I have here will open up a connection and run a command on the on an SQL server. We're going to see how it works now. Um, but what will I put it in? Because it's high risk code. It's very risky. A lot could go wrong. We could get lots of errors. So can you guys think back to, to an SQL statement from long ago? that handles these high, this high risk code when a lot can go wrong. Where do we put code when a lot could go wrong? What do we call that statement? Yo, this is thinking back. If anyone remembers this, your memory is amazing actually. Um, this is all the way back from chapter one. There's a particular statement that when a lot can go wrong, when a lot of errors can occur, you put the code in that statement and it will, handle all of the errors, I guess I'll say, because uh, if I use the proper term, it would give it away. Okay, no one seems to be getting it, so I will use the proper term. What this statement will do is it'll catch the errors that can occur and allow you to process them in a safer way. So what do we call that, guys? What statements is it? A catch statement, it's not just that though. You need to give me the other side of that statement. Because where are we going to put this code? We don't put it in the catch side of the statement. Try catch. Yo. Okay, cool. Um, even after all the hints, I'm still impressed you got it. That's cool. Um, yeah, we're going to put it in the in a try statement. Okay, a try catch statements. Exactly. Cool. So I'm going to remove all this and we're going to connect to a database. Okay. So I have a server, a server running over here um, on my PC. You can imagine the server could be other places though. Um, and yeah, it's running a big database, a gigantic database. Um, we'll, we'll go through it now quickly. Um, so it's got a whole bunch of tables. These are all the tables in my database. Okay. Um, we've got the employee table. Uh, an address table, a person table, a password table, an email address table, a country region table, um, purchase table, vendor table. These are all the tables in the database. Okay. There are a lot of them, as you can see. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is connect to this database and we're going to run a query. So for now, I'm actually just going to run um, a single query. So I'm going to hit new query over here. Okay. Uh, so this is going to give me a, like a little an SQL editor where I can write a query for for this database. Okay, so here we are. Um, so this will just be a standard query that I'm going to want to run. But remember, I want to be able to run it from a C sharp application. I want to eventually be able to run it from a C sharp application. But for now, I'm just going to run it with standard SQL. So you can see I'm in a dot SQL um, file here. So I'm just going to type a normal SQL statement. Okay. 
I'm going to want to just fetch everything from the database just to get a hang of it. So I'm going to use select. Okay, select star from. Okay. Now, there are a lot of tables you can see here, right? Lots of tables. The database is called AdventureWorks. So I'm going to say select star from AdventureWorks, okay? AdventureWorks dot, okay. I have to explain a little bit some uh, a little bit here. You can see that each of the tables has a some brackets after it. So you can see we've got currency sales, work order production, um, person person, okay. What these you can see there's also a person phone person and phone number type person, state province person. So what the person is specifying is the object that this is a part of. So I'm looking inside the person object and I'm fetching the person table, okay? So this is just the name of the table. It's adventureworks.person.person, exactly how we had before. Our name was just like books, for example. It was simpler, but that's because our schema was much simpler, right? Our database design was much simpler. Um, this, is, this is saying the name of the database is adventureworks. The object I'm looking for is person, and the person object has a table called person, and that's the table that I'm looking for, the person table, okay? Now, when I run this query, you can see it'll quickly give me a response here. Here's the response that it gave. This is our table, okay? This is the table inside our database. All right, pretty nice table. Um, we've got a first name, middle name, last name, suffix, email, promotion, demographics, um, a bunch of stuff, okay? The last time the table was modified, cool. Um, and we can see how many responses do we have? We have 19,972 people stored in this database. 19,972. So this is a big table, guys. This, there's a lot of data in this database. There's a lot of data in this table, okay. Um, cool. But what we wanna do is be able to run this request from C Sharp. Um, and we might be able to do it if, if I speed up a little bit in this lecture. Okay, so I'm gonna put it in a try statement because it's very high risk connecting to a database. And we're just going to catch any errors that occur. So um, I'll call it exception E. And if that error occurs, we're just going to print out as um, some kind of error message. Okay, so console dot right line. Um, in fact, we, whatever message that came with this exception E, we'll just print out that message. Okay, so E dot message. There we go. So that's just going to catch any errors. So this is just a safer way for us to to write this code. There we go. Um, so what we're going to do is connect to the database and run that little SQL command that I just showed you and just print it all out to the console and then we'll continue next week. Okay, um, so yeah, let's do that. Um, hmm. Cool. So uh, actually, yeah, I'll use the slide because you guys will probably be watching this anyway. So. Okay, the first thing we have to do is open a connection to the database, which means we have to tell the computer where the database is. We have to tell our app where the database is. Um, luckily, most databases provide a thing called, um, if I show you over here, uh, where could I see it? There you go, properties. So most databases provide what's called a connection string, a connection string. Um, and the connection string is just gonna tell you where to find the database. So it's a string. Right, so it's gonna be saved in a string. So I'm gonna say string, connection string. Um, and I just got it on the right there inside properties. So connection string equals, okay, did I spell connection wrong? No, it's fine. Okay, connection string and there's our connection string. Okay. Why is it complaining to me? Okay, it's just never used, cool. So there we go, we've got a connection string. You can see this specifies a source user PC, that's just the name of my computer, initial, whatever, um, catalog, AdventureWorks, that's the name of the, the database that we're connecting to. And it's telling us what security to use. Integrated security is what we're using, okay. You don't have to know all the technicals of what this means. This is just the connection string. It's telling us where to find this database, okay. Um, and with using that connection string, if we import the correct namespace, which I'm going to now, so we can say using system.data, we want to become an SQL client to the server, okay? To this AdventureWorks database saved on the user PC server, we want to be an SQL client, okay? So I'm importing, I'm saying using system.data.sql client because I need the classes that are going to make me an SQL client. Um, 
So what classes are we going to use? The first one is to open up an SQL connection, okay? SQL connection. And for that, we have a class called SQL connection, okay? SQL connection. Okay. SQL connection, um, we, we'll call it just connection. So I'm going to call the object that we save in here connection. And then we're just going to open a new SQL connection. So we're going to say new SQL connection. And what am I connecting to? I'm connecting to this database, okay? The, the database specified by the connection string, okay? So that will connect to the database. That's all, that connects to the database. Now, the next thing we wanna do is specify the command that we wanna run. We wanna specify the command that we're going to run. So we're gonna use SQL command. That's another class that exists inside um, system.data.sql clients. Um, SQL command. So this is where we'll specify the command that we want to run. Okay. And the command has to be linked to um, a connection, obviously, because in order to run the command, it needs to be linked to a particular database. And in order, order to link it to the database, you have to link it to the SQL connection connecting to that database. So SQL command command equals um, connection, connection, connection dot create command dot create command. So that's going to create an SQL command for us. And then we can just give the command whatever text we want to run. So I'm going to say command dot command text equals, and then the exact query I want to run. You can see this format here is literally just a query. It's the, it's the exact SQL query that we would run. So I'm going to go and fetch the SQL query that we want to run over here. Select star from, so select all from adventureworks.person.person. That is the query we, query we are running. And I'm going to specify that as the command text. Okay. So that's our SQL command. And what we can do now is send that SQL command to the server and just run it. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is say uh, we, we have to open up the connection first. So connection.open will open the connection to the database. So the, the connection string, this now knows where it will be connecting, but it hasn't opened the connection yet. So you say connection.open and that'll actually open the connection, opens a database connection with the property settings specified by SQL connection dot connection string. Okay, so that opens the connection um, specified by the connection string. And then we can run the command and save it to what is called an SQL data reader. SQL data reader. This will work a lot like the XML reader. The S SQL data reader will work a lot like the um, with like the XML reader. So I'm going to call it reader, SQL data reader dot um, reader equals, and we just want to run the command. So we've got command is the name of the object storing our SQL command, and we're just going to execute it. Okay, there's lots of ways we can execute it. For now, we're going to execute reader. That's how we're going to execute it. Okay, and you'll see it. So what I'm going to do is just print out. So I'm going to say while. Um, reader.read, um, this is the last thing we'll do. So I'll just show you this um, and then we'll uh, continue on later. So what I'm gonna do is just print out each part of the response, although I don't wanna print out everything. So, um, because you can see that there's a lot going on. There's 19,000 rows. Uh, so let me just think quickly. Mm, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll do it simply. So I'm gonna say, while reader.read, so while there is more to read, more in the response to read, all we're going to do is say console.write line. Okay. We are going to print out, and I want to print out, let's say I want to print out the first name and the last name. Okay. Just the first name and the last name. Okay. Um, so in order to see what the first name and the last name is, there's one more question I have for you guys. Um, this will also be pretty good revision, I think. So I'm going to run this query again. So there we go. Let's execute that query. So it's executing. Ooh, sorry about that. Ooh, executed. Oh, uh, oh, did I not click on the right thing when trying to run this? Uh, hmm. There you go. Um, so it executed the query, guys. Now, bear in mind, how would I, if I was storing this in a computer, okay, if I was storing this in a computer, you can see each column will give us, so each row will be like one entry and each column will be another entry. 
if I wanted to get the first name and the last name, okay, let's say this was an array, what index would I access? So pretend we've got one record, let's just consider this first record. Let's say that record was stored in some kind of array on a computer. If I wanted to get the first name and the last name, which index would I access? Which index would I access? Can you guys tell me that? And this is the last difficult question you're gonna to have to answer for today. Okay, so that's gonna give me first name, four, perhaps. How am I gonna get the last name out of this database, guys? Out of this array. So Jatsun, you're correct on first name. I think let's, I mean, I won't count yet. How do we get the last name? So first name is there, last name. How do we get last name? If it's an array, four and six, exactly. Okay, because zero, one, two, three, four, that's the first name, five, six. Okay, cool. So that's exactly right. So in order to print out the first name and the last name, I'm going to say reader dot get value, get value. And in brackets, I'm going to say four. And then we'll say reader.getValue. And we're going to say six. Okay. So that's how we get those specific columns from, from the XML, from the SQL data reader. Okay. SQL data reader. There we go. So um, let's leave it there. I'm going to run this just to see if our little command is working. So I'm going to say save build and let's go ahead and run console app one again and you can see it's printing out all the first names in our database you can see it's printing out a lot because there's 19,972 rows um, but it did eventually get to the end so there's all the first names and last names in that database table okay and yeah when we come back next week next week will be our last lecture um, or our last new content lecture um, when we come back then, uh, we'll, we'll do some more interesting processing with this data from the, that we got from the SQL data reader. Okay, cool guys. So this ended up being our penultimate lecture, not last week. Uh, sorry to deceive you. I just didn't know that there was this much content in this, in this final section, or I didn't know it'd take us this long to, to work through rather. Okay, let me stop sharing there. Uh, thank you guys for coming. I'll see you all next week. Uh, Cheers, Azam. Thank you. Cheers, Ria. Miss King Kong. Interesting new username. Cool. I like it. You guys do come up with the most creative aliases. Cheers, Jatsun. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Definitely, Bryanston has the most creative ones. Cheers. <laughs>